Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Angel Molina. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Public Affairs here at ASU, and I'm a faculty affiliate of the Center for Latino San American Politics uh, Research. And we're happy, very excited to have our guest today, uh, Maricruz Osorio. Maricruz Osorio is a PhD candidate from UC Riverside. Um, she's a PhD candidate in political science. Her it, the overarching emphasis of her research is political participation in mar marginalized communities with a particular emphasis on risk-taking behaviors, again, within those communities. And um, her overall work is trying to identify the political implications and also the political motivations of such behaviors. Um, and I'm gonna pass the floor to, to her now and she's going to give a little introduction of herself, uh, the title of her talk, and then she'll she'll take it away from there. Maricruz, the floor is yours. Um, well, first of all, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Maricruz Osorio. I am delighted to be here. Um, even in the virtual format, I'm very excited. Um, and for the talk today, let me share my screen. Um, for the talk today, I'll be talking about um, about uh, public opinion of uh, immigrants. This is um, my first ever seminar paper, and I've loved it so much that even after that first iteration, I still thought it was pretty uh, interesting. And the title is "Who is Worthy: uh, Immigrants in a Time of Uncertainty." Um, so let me go ahead and get started with my paper. I'm excited to share with you. Let's see. Um, so just the general consensus of immigration, um, most people agree that we need immigration reform. And when we look at the particulars, right, 80% of the general public agrees that there should be a pathway to citizenship for DACA recipients. Um, 84% agree that legal migration is a general good for the United States. Um, and about 34% believe that we should increase migration with something along 30% saying we should keep it the same and 30% saying that we should decrease migration. Um, and if we take a look at it by, by race, right, and race and ethnicity, um, we see a, a little more in detail how immigration um, is shaped by our uh, racial backgrounds, right? So for non-Hispanic whites, um, about 34% um, agree that we should allow those who came here undocumented to become a citizen after a certain amount of time. Um, and that is, uh, and we see an increase in that in support for, for pathway to citizenship among black people um, and among Hispanics, we see increase it again. Um, so it's important here to really look at when we're talking about immigration uh, and preferences that we really sort out by who we're talking about, um, who's, who has these opinions. Um, and I apologize, I live a mile from an airport. So if you hear it passing by, I'm so sorry. Um, so the general public agrees that we need immigration reform and that we should be supportive um, to some degree. Um, and yet we see uh, public elite, um, political elite rhetoric um, really demonize immigrants. And this is of course not new. We've seen it throughout the history in the US um, and in other parts of the world. Uh, but just for emphasis, right, um, we heard the former president talk about immigrants from less than ideal places and that we should really focus on um, allowing white immigrants, European immigrants to come in. Uh, the Republican Party can increasingly opposes legal migration as well as undocumented migration. Uh, right, and there's this generic talk of invaders of hostiles um, coming into the United States. So this rhetoric really is negative surrounding immigrants, right? The invaders is in, in, in particularly pervasive among um, conservative elites, right? Uh, we remember the bad hombres co comments by um, President, former President Trump um, and the conflation of refugees with MS-13. Uh, so essentially, 
this does translate to particularly um, negative immigration policy, right? So even though the general public want some sort of reform, political elites have been successful in creating things like the Muslim ban and family separation, which were incredibly unpopular among the general public. This leaves an uncertain landscape for immigrants and refugees alike, right? In particular, refugees, um, right? So while on the one hand, we have public opinion that generally states that we should be allowing for pathway to citizenship for individuals, that we should be more accepting of refugees, of people from different areas. The hostile political elite rhetoric has really created this tension um, between what the general public wants and what um, elites do. Uh, now this rhetoric really changes how the public thinks about immigration, right? And it leads us to this, I, this question, under conditions of threat, whether that's perceived threat, um, right, just threat in general, how does our support for immigrants change? Uh, now we know from the threat and immigration uh, preferences literature, right, that when there are perceptions of threat, there's uh, increased distrust in others, um, and this translates in the need and manifests in the need to control others, um, hostility and distrust. You don't want um, individuals who you think are part of your outgroup anywhere near you. Um, you're also more likely to place an emphasis in an external actor, right? So this is why we might be able to explain a figure like Donald Trump, um, who is perceived as equipped to uh, handle the quote unquote crisis. Uh, and you also see that some people might prefer um, this sense of dual objectives where the individual wants the government to protect the homelands by ensuring that the border is protected, for example, while engaging with terrorism abroad. Uh, we also have in times of peace, if you will, uh, very specific immigration preferences, right? We prefer immigrants who are highly educated. We want them to speak English and we want them to be highly skilled. Um, but the analysis thus far has really been missing this, this racial um, component, right? It's not just enough to talk about our preferences as if we all have equal preferences, right? We all um, exist under this racial hierarchy. Um, and Claire Kim really let, kicked this off with their ideas of racial triangulation, but specifically I'll be talking about um, some of the ideas from Natalie Masuoka and Jane Jun, right? Where we, we understand our, our society be, to be structured by white supremacy. Um, where whites are seen at the top, Asian and Latinos and Blacks at the bottom, but not in, in a, a similar order, right? We, we are all underneath a sort of ladder, if you will. And this actually translates pretty directly to immigration attitudes. Uh, whites are more likely to rely on stereotypes and they're more likely to be concerned with undocumented immigration. Uh, black people are less likely to support restrictive policies and immigration, um, and, and they might have a more ambivalent relationship with immigration. And for this, I, I really recommend the work by Carter, um, where she um, she interviews individuals and black individuals to see how the black in, the black um, the black population understands that immigrants are just a subject to the systems of white supremacy. Um, so they don't wish to punish them, but they also know that uh, immigrants are being used to push them further down this racial hierarchy. Really great and interesting work. Um, now with Latinos, we might see this function in both in two ways, um, right? So those who have high racial identity and linked fate, um, are, are gonna be more likely to support um, immigrants. Asian Americans are closer to the top of the racial hierarchy and are less likely to be supportive of um, uh, restrictive immigration policies, but they're also still close enough that there's a little more tension there that needs to be unpacked. 
that I will not have time to do so today. Um, right, so we, we understand that we live in this kind of racial, um, racial prism. Um, and so when we talk about how these xenophobic um, and threats and attacks function with a, a, an ethnic minority, Right, we can see that it functions in one or two ways, right? So those who have high identity, um, we will see that this relates into higher, um, higher engagements. Um, they're, they're more likely to protest, they're gonna vote at larger rates, right? And they're, they're gonna come out in support. Those who have low um, ethnic identity might try to identify with, um, with the ruling party, right? So in, that, in the 2016 case, that was Republicans, and they would say um, Latinos para Trump, and here we can um, we can read the work of Rudy Alamillo, a, a, call, a former colleague of mine. Uh, so I argue then that we must understand racial identity um, to understand how threat functions among racial groups um, and other outgroups. Um, Racial identity creates a different baseline for outgroups. For example, for me as a Chicana, when I think of um, immigrants from Mexico or Central America, they're not really an outgroup. I'm, I don't really feel threatened by, by them. Um, and we also have to understand that racial identity is not um, uniform across all individuals. I am a high identifying, uh, racially identifying individual, but that doesn't mean that another individual with my demographic characteristics will be. Um, so this leads me to two expectations. First, we should still see um, that some sort of sense of, of threat will activate um, uh, a hesitation toward allowing outgroups. But uh, my second hypothesis is that high racial identity will change who that reference of an out group is and therefore um, will correlate with support for immigrants along racial identity lines. Now to do this, I've uh, to test these two hypotheses, I've broken it down by um, two studies. Um, the first was the 2016 ANES pilot. It has questions on immigration and in particular, it has two questions on refugees um, and legal migration, um, also has question on racial identity and, and a number of other control variables that we might expect to see have an effect like ideology. Um, and I follow that study up with a 2018 uh, CCES um, and I'll get to that in, in a minute. Uh, so for the 2016 AENES, there are two questions on refugees. Um, a priming experiment. Then um, these exist within a Likert scale. Um, there's questions on legal immigration, again, on a Likert scale and racial identity um, on a Likert scale, where one is either um, oppose refugees or illegal migration and seven is um, support uh, refugee uh, and uh, legal migration. Um, and for the racial identity scale, one is not strongly identified with my racial identity and seven is highly identified. Uh, so first, uh, let's investigate this idea of, of worthiness and, and, and um, deservingness. Uh, so they have, the 2016 pilot had a question, do you favor, oppose, or neither favor nor oppose Syrian refugees coming into the United States? Um, and half of the respondents got this question, and the other half got uh, the same question with the added priming um, language uh, fleeing the Syrian civil war, right? So again, kind of priming that this is not a threat. This is not a threatening group. Um, they are fleeing the violence. And we see that there's no difference actually in our preference for them. Um, so we're not more likely to want to have uh, refugees who might otherwise be seen as deserving of our protection. Um, so then I wanted to look more closely at, well, how might our racial identity, our race um, kind of configure this, um, affect these, these, these ideas of support? Um, so I ran a seemingly unrelated regression so that I could compare um, support for legal immigration to support for Syrian refugees. Um, 
And what I find, right, first is that worry over local terrorist attacks does just generally have a negative um, negative effect for support for legal migration and Syrian refugees, right? So again, that goes directly to that first hypothesis. Anytime that we have any feelings of threat, we're just less likely to want anyone who might not already be a part of our communities. Um, and here we see that the importance of racial identity is also negatively correlated with support for legal immigration and support for um, Syrian uh, refu uh, for refugees. But this is not as straightforward as, as we might think, right? Um, and I'll get to that in the next slide. Uh, now, if we just take a look by, by racial category, right? Hispanics are more supportive of legal migration um, in a way that no other racial category is. If we just take a look at racial uh, categories and racial identity strength, um, we see that racial ident strength identity, again, is negatively correlated uh, with legal su le support for legal migration. But if we look at that interaction effect of strength of racial identity by the racial categories, um, we see support among Black individuals for legal migration. Um, now, nothing else is um, pops up as significant, but I, I hesitate to say that there aren't more things here worth investigating. The ends in in these, um, the ends in the survey for racial minorities is is quite low. Uh, so I think future studies with um, greater power might show that these also pop up in a way that my theory would suggest. Uh, the still youth left me with a lingering question of, well, why aren't we supporting Syrian refugees who are exposed to this threat, right? Who are should be deemed as deserving by us, um, especially as we think of our um, moral and, and, and normative psyche as a, as a nation. Um, now, I have a hypothesis that it's this underlying racialization of Muslims who have been um, since 9-11 deemed the enemy um, incorrectly, right? But there has been this project to conflate Islam with terrorism and thereby um, marginalizing um, Muslims individual, Muslim individuals in our, in our, um, in our nation. And we also see this dehumanization of Muslim individuals. And for this, I really recommend all of the work by Nasita Laguevardi, who just does remarkable work on the subject. Um, so there's an underlying racialization of Muslims that even though we know Muslims are a, a religious identity, they are undergoing a racialization process. So to investigate if it's this idea of religion that is um, decreasing our support for this otherwise vulnerable population, um, I did a, a priming ex experiment in the 2018 CCES study. Um, and I asked pretty simply the same question as I had before. Do you favor, oppose, nor neither favor or, or oppose Christian refugees from Central America? Christian Syrian refugees or just Syrian refugees. Now this very simple experiment finds that indeed we are um, punishing in a sense Syrian refugees. Um, when we highlight that they're Christian refugees, our support for them increases and is nearly indistinguishable from our support of uh, Central American Christian refugees as well. Um, so here, our outgroup is, is seen as uh, this religious minority uh, with the complication that they're also undergoing a racialization process of their own. Now, if we look again uh, specifically at resettlement questions and race, right? Um, the question of resettlement is, uh, one is I do not want refugees into the United States and three, um, it's one, two, three. Um, and three is, I would want them in my neighborhood. Um, if we look again by race, we see again 
that blacks are much more uh, black individuals are much more accepting of refugees. Um, so here again, we see something to the effect of we are um, we are doing a disservice to our discipline when we just put in a race variable. There are nuances here to our support for immigration along our racial identities um, and also the strength that we have to that racial identities. Now, unfortunately, the, two, the 2018 CCES study did not have a question on racial, uh, racial identity strength. So I couldn't include that in, in this regression. Um, and again, the N for these individuals is pretty small. I think for Asians, I have 26 respondents. Um, so for future iterations, we really want to be investigating this with a little more, um, with a little more strength. Um, so just to recap, right? When we're thinking about immigration policies, we really should not be using just race as a control, right? Race. Uh, racial categories and racial ethnic identities are incredibly important in how they shape our positionality in the world and therefore our political attitudes. Um, and we should also be investing in this idea of racial identity strength um, more so than we have in the past. There's good work out there that has started to do this, so that has been doing this, but here I really want to emphasize that we need to do more work on this. Um, Immigration preferences, public opinion on immigration is not homogeneous. Um, in our survey work, a lot of this is being driven by white respondents, right? And even they are not equal in how they respond. Um, so we have to think a little more critically about how we talk about immigration policies in our survey uh, instruments. Um, and finally, we need to further investigate this race, racialization process of religion and particularly of, the, of Islam. Um, we can see that there are some real tensions there. And as we see prominence of uh, Muslim individuals, and particularly we have Representative Ilhan Omar, who is a refugee and a Muslim woman herself, right? We're just going to see this to continue to be a question for us social scientists to answer. Um, now there are implications, right? Could we find some work that, um, that perspective taking, right? That emphasizing vulnerability might help us become more accepting of individuals. We see in the literature, um, especially by Adida et al, uh, that there is something to this, um, but we should be trying to replicate it, right, with other types of refugees. We have many that are coming from Central America, and refugees are just going to continue to be a trend throughout the globe as we see increasing climate change. So this issue is not going anywhere. Um, and it really puts us um, in an important position to start developing the theoretical frameworks for how we accept asylum seekers and refugees. Um, and of course, we'll have to keep a close eye for how the Biden administration deals with this tension um, that I highlighted at the beginning of this presentation between what the general public wants um, and what our government has done. Um, so those are things for us to keep looking to in the future. Um, and now I will take your questions. Thank you, Maricruz. Field questions from anyone in the audience. Um, the format we're using for the Zoom webinar is to go ahead and uh, type your questions any questions that you may have into the Q&A box, and we will go ahead and field them in that way. Um, I might be freezing up a little bit, Maricruz, so give me a second. Okay, I'm gonna start off. Let, um, Maricruz, can you, this is more of a, a general question pertaining to the, the overall sco scope of your work and where it fits mm -hmm. into the broader discipline. Um, you made a really good point about the, the need to in, incorporate more nuance, not only into our theoretical models, but also our empirical models when it comes to um, 
some of the issues that you're right that you're grappling with specifically but it got me thinking about where you feel that your broader your your broader work is um you know addressing a gap in the discipline so if you had if, if you had to identify right an area where where you think your work makes the biggest contribution um what do you think that would be um I mean, I think quite simply, um, or maybe not simply, but the straightforward answer here is that uh, I'm speaking directly to the, the question of democracy within political science. Um, now that may not come across um, at first glance, but when we're talking about um, vulnerable populations like refugees, um, or undocumented citizens who do not have DACA or DACA or asylum seekers, right? These are individuals who are um, a part of our communities and part of the fabric of society. Uh, and we tend to omit them from our research, not because we don't think that they're, they're, they're important, but because they're so difficult to study. Um, there's a number of issues that go into studying these vulnerable populations. Uh, so I think that that's the contribution I, I am providing to the discipline is kind of becoming a megaphone for this participation that is already happening. Um, and of course, theorizing their participation, which is not the same as it would be for, for you and, or, and I who are citizens, right? And therefore we have all of the protections that legal citizens um, or that citizens just have, right? This is something that even though an undocumented individual who uh, might have lived here for all of their lives just doesn't have just because they weren't born here, but in any in every other way are a part, are Americans. Um, so I think that that's, that's the larger contribution to the, the discipline. I was muted, sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you for your answer, Maricruz. That's a fantastic answer. Um, I'd like to maybe revisit that point if we have time. But right now we have a, a question from, a, from an audience member. Um, Eddie Lucero uh, has a question. Regarding your theory, should we expect the outgroup to change for different ethnic groups? For example, I can imagine a Latinx person seeing Central American migrants as their in-group. However, Eddie also wonders whether they would view Syrian refugees as an in-group. Yeah, I, I think that that is right. Um, and I think that that's what the ANES um, results showed, right? Um, when I ran the seemingly unrelated regression, it allows us to assume that the, co that the error terms um, correlate. Um, and, and when you take a look at that, uh, we see that uh, Hispanic or Latinx individuals um, are supportive of legal migration, but are not supportive of Syrian refugees. Uh, so that's exactly right. Our racial identifications will shape who we see as an out group. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Mari Cruz. We'll take um, a question from Rodney. Rodney, are you there? I think Rodney had a question. I don't know if he can hear me right now though. Well, until Rodney uh, fixes his issue, I'm going to take a question from, uh, from Angie Bautista Chavez, another one of our um, esteemed faculty colleagues and um, affiliates, uh, actually a, a key member of the center, not just an affiliate uh, like myself. Uh, um, thank you for your work, Mari Cruz. Uh, Angie wants to thank you for your work. Um, Mari, uh, Angie says your work underscores why theories of public opinion on mi migration must also engage with issues of securitized migration, issue linkage, and the politics of deservingness, where some groups are deemed deserving of protection while others are deserving of, uh, of punishment. And now, Mari Cruz, do you have plans to replicate this study among other populations, uh, perhaps elected officials or public servants? Yes. Um... So I did try to replicate the study um, with the UCLA Reps Lab, um, but there my N was even smaller. 
the total amount of respondents was 400 and, and, and change. Um, so I, I didn't present those findings because you know the, the confidence that I would have in any findings there would be none. <laughs> um, but yeah, I do, I do, I do foresee this project um, developing into a, a question where we 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 ask elites and, and public officials and, and really local officials, right? Because that's where refugees tend to go. Um, that's where they get their support from primarily. Um, but but that's probably like a couple of years from now. Okay, I want to add something to the question that uh, Dr. Bautista Chavez posed uh, in terms of public servants that you might target for replication of this kind of study. Um, if you've thought specifically about what kind of bureaucracies or um, what kind of bureaucratic agents and what kind of policy areas you might incorporate, um, the, what, do you, what do you see as a good opportunity for, for this sort of replication in, in the local public policy arena? Yeah, um, so, I mean, primar primarily, um, I would want to I would want to investigate this question um, in comparison of two states. I would want to look at California and Texas. While both states receive a large number of refugees, have large number of um, other types of migrants, and yet have such distinct um, state level immigration policies. So there, when I would ask local officials, we can really see the power that local officials have in deciding this question of deservingness. Um, so there the question becomes, well, how do local officials either enforce hostile immigration policies or choose not to enforce um, restrictive immigration policies to the benefit of these vulnerable populations? Um, but that's just like a, uh, th those are just some thoughts, nothing written on paper. Um, but I think that that's where that question would be, right? That local enforcement and the power of um, local officials to really make a change, even when um, policies may not be to, to their liking for a lack of a better word. Thank you for that answer. We have two more questions from audience members. I'm gonna take the first from uh, Ben Ferrer. Ben, I hope I pr I'm pronouncing your last name correctly. Um, Maricruz, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I had two questions. First, Ben wants to know, um, he'd like for you to talk about the empirical implications of your research uh, for future surveys. It strikes Ben that current surveys are not very nuanced. Maricruz, what do you think are the most important ways for surveys to improve? What are the most important questions to ask? Uh, in addition to that, Ben would also like to hear more about your racial hierarchies. Um, and if you had enough respondents, what do you think would be the most important ways to expand that theory uh, along the lines of intra-group differences? What do you think would matter the most? Um, okay, uh, good to hear from you, Ben. Um, so I, I think the first question, um, what are better ways to improve surveys? I, I mean, there's just this collective work that the discipline has to do uh, to invest in asking um, more respondents of color to participate. It's expensive. It's really expensive to get um, racial minorities to participate. Uh, and, and this skews our understanding pretty pretty deeply. If you just took my, if, if I did my research and just looked at racial identity without doing an interaction of also the racial category, I would come to um, incorrect conclusions about um, a racial identity. Um, so I think that that's one, right? The, that there is some work that the discipline must do um, in order to be able to provide uh, accurate answers to American politics, especially since the demographics of the country are changing. Um, it is incumbent upon us to plan for the future and to create that infrastructure now. Um, so I think that that's, that's what I would say for that first question. Um, and you know, if, if I were 
selfishly asking questions on surveys, I would definitely want to ask more questions about risk assessment. Um, I don't think that we realize that individuals have different risks associated with um, participation. Um, and this is something that my dissertation is really trying to investigate, right? A protest for me is not the same as a protest is for, well, for, for you, Ben, right? Like if I went to a protest, I might be, there's a greater probability that I will face violence than if you, if you were at a protest, right? And we saw this, right? When we see the Black Lives Matter protest, they face a lot of um, police violence. Well, we don't see the same at a majority white protests or even like the women's marches, right? Which were predominantly white and received backlash for that. Um, so I think, you know, like really understanding that risk is not assessed the same way by individuals, both along racial lines and by citizenship status um, and by gender, right? So this is a big complicated question about how we, we participate. Um, so that's something that I would want to really investigate and I think would help us understand the state of our democracy much better. Uh, now, your second question was about, Angel, can you help me out? Yeah, of course. Um, so if you had enough respondents, what do you think would be the most important ways to expand your current theory? Now, what are the intra-group differences that you think would matter the most? Yeah. Um, Absolutely, great question. Um, so this is a conversation that I recently had with my students in Kamba. Um, uh, you know, there's this understanding that, um, you know, whites have this, are, are like the bad guys, the boogeyman, but it's really the system of white supremacy here. So when we're talking about the racial hierarchy, we're talking about white supremacy. Um, so when we're talking about intragroup differences, it's those individuals who are trying to um, who are trying to achieve a closer level of whiteness um, that are going to try to adhere to the system of oppression. And we see this within the Asian American community, right? Um, with particularly with the uh, some members of the Chinese community. Um, so I think that that is where we could really expand our theory about uh, racial hierarchies and racial identity. Um, it's investigating this notion of white supremacy. Um, so I, I don't I don't know if if that helps, but I think that we would see a, a similar tension among all racial and ethnic identities, right? Because there are always individuals within those communities. They're trying to adhere to white supremacy um, while others realize that they could never achieve whiteness and therefore fight against it. Um, and those in the middle, right, who have, a, have to feed their families and that's the primary concern and that is fair. Um, so I hope that that answers your question. Maricruz, we have time for two more. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the next one is from uh, Lenka Butiskova. The majority of, Mus of Muslims do not live in the Middle East. Many Muslims come from Asia. How does it factor into your research and your concept of racial hierarchy? How do you disentangle these different categories of Muslims, refugees and mixing up of uh, religious and ethnic identities? Yeah, um, this is such an excellent question. Um, unfortunately, uh, so I will preface this by saying that I also taught a globalization class once um, two summers ago. And I know for a fact that my students could not place, um, let's say Nepal on a map um, or Indonesia, right? So I think unfortunately, um, so I think unfortunately um, most Americans are just not aware that the majority of Muslims do not live in the Middle East. Um, so I, I, I think that, you know, if there was more education of the general public about um, Islam and um, where Muslims come from and how their practices different, uh, are different, right, that there are different sects within, um, within the 
uh, Muslim community, um, then we could have this kind of disentanglement of different categories. Um, but I don't think that the public is there yet. Um, hopefully we will be one day. It would be great if we could see the nuance there too. Uh, but I don't think that the general public can make those distinctions. Now for a question from Eddie Lucero, who he, he wants to follow up on my question. Um, <clears throat> and he suggests that perhaps you should consider street level bureaucrats such as police officers or social service workers as other sub subjects of study. Um, and perhaps even think about how their identity affects their behavior towards migrants of different backgrounds. Are these issues that you've given any thought to in your current work or perhaps have plans to address in subsequent um, projects? Yeah, um, absolutely. So I don't answer this question at all with this paper, um, but for other work that I've, um, I've done, um, we do find that, right? Uh, police officers who, there was a study that we were doing on police, uh, police chiefs versus sheriffs, right? And I think when we were talking about police chiefs in particular, right, they're more in tune to their community and who their community members are. So again, we're going back to this idea of in-group, out-group. And when, I, when we interviewed them, their primary concern was to protect their community. And that included undocumented migrants. Um, so as opposed to sheriffs who have an incentive to be seen as hard on crime um, and who were incredibly hostile to immigrants um, of, of any kind, right? And we're seen as that group. Um, so I think that that's how identity changes, right? Um, even among, um, even in racial categories here, because the master status, the master class here um, would be that elected versus unelected position because um, there's less punishment for, for their actions if, if they're um, pol police chiefs as, or sheriffs, right? There's different incentives there happening. Maricruz, I'm gonna go to the final question that we have for now. Uh, again, another question from Dr. Batista Chavez. Uh, she would like to learn more about your research on risk. The risk of political participation is not equally distributed. E uh, arrest, police brutality, and even risk of being fired from time off of work. Can you tell us more about how surveys might also be better equipped to more appropriately measure risk, or perhaps a multi-method set of tools are necessary? Um, definitely a multi-method set of tools is necessary. Um, for my dissertation, I will be doing um, in-depth interviews with um, civic engagement um, directors or, or holders among um, immigrant organizations. Um, so so I, I definitely think that that's a part of it, but we can also get at this empirically just by asking. Um, so I'm, develop I'm in the middle of developing an instrument to just ask about how risky any one political act is perceived by respondents. Um, and of course, we can ask this question and also ask about citizenship status and gender and see how the interaction of the three might be affecting um, a risk, right? Um, but I, I think that um, to just kind of push more on my dissertation or to help uh, maybe enlighten this conversation, it's, it's that also the, the gains, the, politi the, the, the political costs of not acting um, are even higher for some of these communities, right? Um, so what I argue for my dissertation is that those who have a, an invested sense of defending their community are just much more likely to take this risky political participation because they know what's, what's, what they can lose. Um, so it's, it's not just a matter of um, risk taking, but also the loss aversion, right? Like what could I lose if I don't fight for my rights, fight for my place in this community? Um, and in a way it's, even though they may not have citizenship stat, like a legal status here, 
they have courageous citizenship in a way that I'm not sure I would have because um, it's it's really scary. And this is anecdotal, but I was at a DACA rally for research um, for a, a report on uh, immigrants in the Inland Empire. And so I was just there to observe and I was really scared. <laughs> there were cops everywhere. And, you know, like the, the undocumented um, young people were at the front of the stage and they're chanting undocumented, unafraid. Um, and I'm just there like to research and I must have looked so freaked out because uh, there were so many police that another individual came up to me and he's like, um, he told me, um, hermana, no te preocupes, estamos aquí contigo, uh, which translates to sister, don't worry, we're here with you. Um, so it's actually really courageous what those individuals do, and it's because they have everything to lose. Um, so I'm working on those measures and to keep keep tuned in, and hopefully I'll be able to present something like that to you soon. Um, but we should we should be investigating this from various angles. Maricruz, before we wrap up, I did want to give you an opportunity to um, <clears throat> share more insight about your overall dissertation project with us. If you want to take a few minutes to talk about the broader scope of the dissertation and, and what, the, what the individual components of the overall project might look like. Yeah, um, well, I mean, I guess I've already been talking about it. Um, it's kind of hard to get me to stop talking about it, but uh, that, that's the <laughs> trick, that's the trick. Uh, so my, my, my research question is investigating why individuals take, um, take part in risky political participation. And my argument is exactly what I had just said. Um, one, that risk is not addressed equitably and that it's in fact um, evaluated by two different types of risk assessments. First, you have to assess if this is a risk to yourself or to your community. And this doesn't mean that it can't be both. Um, but that the emphasis will be placed on either, this is more of a risk to me than it is to my community. So it's kind of a relative notion of risk. Um, so that's the first. And for those individuals who feel that there is more risk to their community, they're gonna be much more likely to seek ways to engage in political participation. So for these individuals that wanna participate, they have to undergo a second risk assessment. Um, that is contingent upon their citizenship status. Um, so an, an individual who is undocumented may not feel like they can go to their elected official or um, to protest, but they may in fact organize um, know your rights campaigns. Um, now for somebody who has temporary protected status, um, they might lead like something like the journey for justice um, which is a bus tour that starts in California and Los Angeles and goes all the way to the East Coast, holding rallies uh, to garner support for, for their right to stay. Um, uh, so that second risk assessment is really by citizenship status to determine what kind of participation is less risky to them while still engaging in, in their communities and defending for their rights. Um, and I think that's the Cliff Notes version of it. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> we're going to save the, the final question here is from, uh, I'm going to ask it on Rodney's behalf. I don't know that Rodney can uh, jump in on, on, on his own right now. So let me go ahead and ask it. Um, Rodney wants to know that if we describe most or all groups as Christian, does that almost uniformly lead to support? Uh, what are your findings that you find most surprising uh, and not consistent with your, your theoretical expectations? Um, you know, I really thought that I would see something more, I thought I would see decreased support for Central Americans. Um, you know, I think at the end of the day, uh, Syria is still, um, sorry about the noise. Uh, um, you know, Syrians are still, you know, like a part of the other side of the ocean, right? and they haven't been talked about as invaders or chain migration or they're not sending their best, right? So I really thought that I would see 
less support for Central Americans than I, I did. Uh, but there's something about Christianity that is doing a lot more work than I, I originally realized. The reason I asked that question, um, uh, the, the Central American um, question was because I was interested to see the racialization process that might be happening. Um, but I was really surprised to see that it was equitable among both Syrian Christian refugees and Central American Christian refugees. Um, so that, 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 that was surprising. And I would be interested, I, I will be looking more into this in, in, in future iterations. Excellent. Well, I don't think we have any more questions at this point. Uh, Rodney, if you're listening, did you want to say a couple of uh, parting remarks before we yes, money for this girl? Can you, can you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. I've been having, as you know, a lot of technical difficulties today. Well, first, I wanted to thank uh, everyone in the audience for coming to our event. We really appreciate it, and we hope it's interesting, and you will come to other of, of our events. And I'd like to thank Angel for uh, moderating, and most importantly, perhaps, Mari Cruz uh, for her presentation. She's engaging questions, I think, that are you know somewhat distinct, unique, where she's looking at matters like risk and threat and those kinds of uh, questions that are not all that prominent in the literature, and I think they they're worthy of, of attention. So I, I you know I thank you for for the, your presentation and for bringing those questions into the discussion around uh, immigration and how it's understood and how different groups in American society see it and how they see different groups from different places in different ways depending on how they are described as Christian or Muslim uh, or whatever the case may be. Uh, so, so it's beginning to, I think, you know, begin to kind of clarify a lot of this complexity and unravel or, or you know, deconstruct, so to speak, our understandings of around immigration issues. So again, uh, thank you so much. Thank you for everyone in the audience. Thank you, Don Hill. And we, again, we certainly uh, hope and look forward to having uh, all of you who are out there at future events. And we all very much look forward to the time that we can do more events in person. So uh, to everyone, please stay safe, be safe. And again, thanks and uh, have a good weekend.